Hi, welcome back to Healthy Minds. We're gonna talk in this segment a little bit more about mental illness. What mental illness is and is not. Is not. First of all, mental illness is a biological brain disorder that interferes with normal brain chemistry. Genetic factors may create a predisposition in some people and life stresses may trigger the onset of symptoms. Number two, mental illness is very common. In one year, approximately 57.7 million Americans experience a mental health disorder in a given year. One in 17 li li I'm sorry, lives with a mental illness such as schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, or bipolar disorder. Number three, mental illness is an equal opportunity disease, striking families from all walks of life, regardless of age, race, income, religion, or education. Number four, and this is a big one for us, mental illness is devastating to the person with mental illness and their families. One's thinking, feeling, and relating are disturbed, seriously reducing the ability to live a normal life. All family members are affected. And lastly, mental illness is treatable. Appropriate medical care and rehabilitation enable many people to recover enough to live productive lives. What mental illness is not? It's not anybody's fault. They are not caused by poor parenting or weak character, just like someone doesn't choose to get cancer or heart disease or hypertension, you don't choose to be mentally ill. Number two, mental illness is not preventable or curable at this time. Great advances are being made, but there's no known cure for mental illness. And lastly, mental illness is not hopeless. These illnesses present difficulty, but help is available. And Do you want to add to that? I just want to interject the idea that it's, it's a no-fault illness. Um, for about 50 years in this country, psychiatry taught that mental illness was the fault of the mother. And uh, if you can imagine how devastating that has been to many families over the years. I mean, but now they know it's a no-fault illness. Much of it is. Uh, can be genetic, a genetic link to it, and um, often it can be no genetic link as well. But more often than not, there's a genetic link in the family history. Um, we've taught the NAMI family to family class for five years now. We're in our fifth year, and we've met many people. For, for some people, their mother or father has a mental illness. For some people, their spouse has a mental illness. They come because their sister or brother has a mental illness or they come because their children have mental illness. And believe me, these people are from all walks of life. And they're in crisis when they come. They just, they're throwing their hands up and they don't know what to do. They don't know if they're gonna be able to cope because their family members are doing a variety of things from you know, getting naked to uh, doing really high risk behaviors. Um, uh, particularly college students, uh, and just a, a host of, of, of behaviors that present themselves uh, with mental illness. And let me, let me mention suicide for a moment. <clears throat> In the current class that my wife and I are teaching, uh, we have about three caregivers who have loved ones who are, have been actively talking about taking their own lives. And suicide is very serious. It is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S more common than homicide, in fact. And it is the third leading cause of death for ages 15 to 24 years of age. More than 90% of those who die by suicide had one or more mental disorders. And we don't skirt around this issue. We talk about it head on. Um, it's a subject you need to talk about with, with people. Don't pretend like it doesn't exist. And if I bring it up, some people are afraid if I bring it up, I might put the idea in their head or make them act upon it. In fact, uh, mental health pr practitioners tell us it's better to discuss it. Is there a plan? What are you thinking about? And maybe get the help that they need at that point uh, if it's very serious. Interestingly enough, someone at work gave me an article today written by his niece who's in college and she has major depression. And in the article she wrote, she talked about 
just feeling so depressed and suicidal mm -hmm. to the point that she frequently, almost on a daily basis, wanted to jump in front of a car or something, and she had to hold that in. And she talked about how church members will sometimes say, oh, you got to give that to the Lord, instead of engaging her and really talking about what's on her heart. When we, for those that uh, are Christian or whatever your faith, and you, you may make a statement like that, you think you're being helpful, but it's not helpful at all. Somebody, those people want to be heard, they want to be listened, they want you to see who they are and sense what they're feeling. Um, so that was very interesting to me as well. So I think at this point you want to talk about the uh, predictable stages of emotional response. Okay. So first there's the catastrophic event that something has happened to your loved one. And let me just jump in. These are um, stages that family members go through. There's predictable stages that those with mental illness go through and there's predictable stages that family members go through. So there's, there's the shock that there's something wrong with your loved one. And during this time, there's a lot of um, crisis and chaos going on, uh, disbelief, confusion, uh, denial, um, you know, just a, a sense of being shattered and not knowing what to do. And it is a time of crisis, uh, often uh, complicated by denial. And then there's hoping against hope that it's really not that bad, it must be something else, but it couldn't be mental illness. Right. And then in our own experience, that's what we kept thinking. Oh, this has got to be something else. His, he's a man. He's a boy. He's, he's going into, you know, malehood. It's college, the stress of college. It's the people he's hanging around. We wanted to attribute the mental illness to all those things, even to that it was marijuana. And many times we kept thinking, why won't he, why isn't he testing for something stronger? We thought meth and fit, something, but it would never, it would only come out marijuana. And that led the doctors to believe, no, there's something underlying going, this is not just the addiction. So the family members will use, use denial and not want to sometimes face the fact because of the strong stigma in our society about being mentally ill. Families don't want to share that with other people, that someone in the family has a mental illness. And so um, during this time of crisis and shock, what the family needs is empathy, they need crisis intervention, comfort and support. And that's what NAMI brought to us. Stage two. Stage two is learning how to cope, going through the mill. Often when families acknowledge that something is going on, then they have anger and guilt and resentment, particularly mothers or others will, what did I do wrong? Um, but you have to recognize that something catastrophic is going on and grieve through that. And these stages aren't stagnant. Sometimes the family members will go back and forth. And then once you get to the point where you begin to accept what's going on, then you move into advocacy. And that's where we're at today. We're in the stage of advocacy for our loved one and the loved ones of others. And in advocacy, we find he healing and hope and, and power and comfort. And none of these stages are wrong. Family members wonder, why am I so angry at my loved one? Why am I feel guilty? But these are normal stages um, based on all of the research that family members will go through. Well, thank you very much for this uh, segment. Hope to see you in the future.